get minimal public school. So for me, the bargain's fair. I paid nothing and I got nothing. Um, if you came later and you pay more taxes, you might think a bargain is a lot less fair. It's not my favorite bargain, but I can't, I don't wait on doing it. Uh, so the idea that there are goods that are provided in quantities that are not the quantity people would choose is pervasive. And it's particularly pervasive in goods that government provides, and also it's pervasive in goods that you think of as natural. The amount of number of acres in the Yellowstone ecosystem subject to wolf predation. Right? There's gonna be one number, and people around here in this class are gonna say, look, if it were a sheep, let's pay them a sheep worrying fee as well as uh, you know, a sheep caring fee. And the truth is, is that the wolves don't actually attack their children. Um, and they decided to live in the country, which means they take certain risks with their dogs anyway. Um, and maybe we'll pay them off for that too. And let's increase the area in which we have wild and free roaming wolves. And if you went to a different group, they would say, what's this craziness? You paid $400,000 to feed wolves, sheep? Are you insane? You can do other stuff with the $400,000, right? You get some very different answers. There's only one number of wolves you can have. I can't have my number high and have someone else have a different number low. So it also shows up naturally in environmental problems. So now we know about publicly provided goods. Remember, public good is we've got this non-rival thing going. If I consume it, you can still consume it. A publicly provided good could be something like 12, K through 12 education. The government's the buyer of it, and that causes it to exist in one amount. Private good, though, it may be. We have wolves. wolves. Let's have exact you know, diagram on the next slide. I want to go for this. E, V, and C, V for a publicly provided good. And then I think we've had enough, and we'll go and look at some other stuff. Let's see if we can do this right. So let's suppose you start out with some fixed. Okay, let's see if I narrate it right. You start out at this bundle A. So I have some amount of dollars, and I have some amount of wolves. I've drawn the thing so it has really extreme curvature. If you don't like the fact that I gave it an absolute square down the bottom, I don't care. Round it off a little bit. It won't make any difference. I just need the thing to turn over very quickly. Right. I got turning over very quickly. And if you draw a price line, it would be tangent down here, would it not? So I have two things going for me. One, this thing, instead of having a nice channel curve, being a different curve doesn't have a nice channel curve, and a really tight curve. And the second thing is, if you could imagine a price line between wolves and all other stuff, you would imagine it would be tangent somewhere down here, and I peg you up here, which means that's not what you would choose. It's what's been chosen for you. Now I ask, what happens if I add wolves? So suppose I add five wolves. Yeah. Where do I get to? I get out here, same money, five extra wolves. Government, government gets you five more wolves. You're on a new higher indifference curve. I could ask about compensating variation. Something good got done for you, so what do I have to do to compensate for that? Something good or bad? I want to get you back to your original indifference curve. I did something nice to you. What do I have to do now? Something bad. And what's the bad thing I can do in this diagram? Yeah, you're just pointing at it. I steal your money, right? How much of your money do I have to steal to get you back? $10. So I have the compensating variation is $10. That's fine. Let's try to do equivalent variation. Here I am, bundle A. I've moved over to bundle B. And what's equivalent variation? I did a nice thing for you in an equivalent variation. Do I do a nice or bad thing for you to get equivalent variation? I do a nice thing, right? I want to do something that gives you the same amount of happiness. And so, since I'm not adding wolves, I add money. How much money do you have to add here before you get to that indifference curve? Any idea? I mean, it's drawn infinity, right? And so here, the equivalent variation is infinite, and the compensating variation is $10. So once you allow me to make these things really squarey looking, and you allow me to put you somewhere other than where the price line would be, then I can create examples where compensating and equivalent variations spread way out. Well, which one's right? Is it that the wolves are worth $10, or the wolves are worth an infinite amount? You got an answer? Is one of these two measures more appealing? I mean, other than the absurdity of infinity? Anyone want to argue for one or the other? Well, on a purely logical basis, the answer is no, right? In one case, I'm asking, what would it take to compensate? That's a reasonable measure of what something's worth. And in the other case, I'm asking, well, if instead of getting this, uh, these additional wolves, I gave you money, how much would you want? That's a reasonable measure. The point is that they're both reasonable measures. This one is just gives you a pretty, pretty silly answer. You could draw this so it's less absurd. And maybe you want to take a second, draw the same diagram. And just instead of drawing this straight up and down, and I'll do it on the board and you can do it at, you know, at your seat. Let's draw it just a little more reasonable. Oh, I can try it. Wait, I can try it with my pen. You can try it at your seat. Ooh. So I'm going to try to draw the same thing. I'm going to try to draw it really steep, but not outrageous. Yeah? A and B again. And now, if I go straight up, right, I'll find an amount of money, but it'll be really large. Yeah? So if you don't like my completely squared off version, try to draw yourself a version that's steep, but not completely squared off. And if you really want to experiment with it a bit, if you try it down in here, you won't get anything like the, the, the difference between the two. Yeah? Uh, which, which, this, my, my, this thing? This one? It's meant to be a straight line to show how much money I would get. I'll do it on the board where I, I won't make as much of a wreck of it. Right. So let's just do this. Here, I, I want to see her. Right. And I'm going from A to B. And I want to get up to this higher indifference curve, curve two, by adding money. And so I go straight upwards. Right. I'm just going straight up until I find the intersection with the new curve. It's not tangent. And I'm measuring this distance from where my intersection is to the old one. And that's the amount of money I have to add. So what I'm doing here is I'm going starting at bundle A, and I'm adding money, and I keep adding money, which means I go straight up, right, until I hit the other curve. And then I measure the distance. Is that, is that better? Okay. Yeah, that's the equivalent variation, right? Because there's two equivalent ways to get to the new indifference curve. One, add wolves. Two, add money. Right? That's equivalent. Compensating is 
I got you to the new indifference curve. What do I have to do to get you back? Right? So I add wolves and take money and end up where I started. And then remember, the reality, the project is adding wolves. What the economist is supposed to do for you is to give you a money measure of what it's worth. To say, we're thinking of increasing the, you know, the area in which we're going to let the wolves roam. And you hire an economist to say, well, what's that worth? What would people be willing to pay for it? And the economist somehow should create a diagram, hopefully not this one. Um, and having created a diagram like that, he should be able to say, or she should be able to say to you, oh, okay, so if you added five wolves, then um, that would make people happier, and the amount by which you made them happier um, is $12. And then the person said, so how do you calculate that? They say, well, I asked the question this way. If I added the wolves and took away money, how much money would I have to take away to get them where they were before? And we call that compensating variation. Or they could have answered the other way. I um, looked to see how happy they'd be with the extra five wolves, and then I asked, how much money do I have to add to make them just that happy? And then you'd report a number, and hopefully it would be like, you know, $40. And then you'd ask, well, who does it apply to? And it applies to people who care about the wolves, and they're scattered all over the United States. So it's 40 times 360 million, and therefore the wolves are worth 1.4 billion. Yeah. That's what you'd hope for if you wanted to do the project. Yes? For what experiment? No, no. The, the project is AI wolves. The project's always the same. I always add five wolves. But I want to know, how much is that worth? Okay? And I want to know that because somebody who's making the decision wants to be told adding five wolves is worth you know, $100,000, and he already knows that five wolves will cost him $700 in foreign cheap, and then he can say, well, wait a minute, people are willing to pay $100,000 for the wolves, and once I've got $700 to get them, this is a good idea, let's increase the number of wolves. Right? That's why you want the number. But you, as the analyst, are doing a thought experiment. You're saying, adding five wolves has got to have some money value to it. How do I find that? And there are two conceptual things you can do. One is you can say, adding five wolves and taking away, what was it, $10, leave you where you were before. Thought experiment, take away $10. And so the five wolves are worth 10 bucks, and you report $10. And then you would have reported compensating variation. There's only one real project. What? I don't know. In, in reality here, as drawn, it's worth, like, as drawn, they're worth 10. The project's worth 10 as drawn by compensating variation. It's infinitely valuable by equivalent variation. Right? And that's just to show you that the two exact measures don't always coincide, coincide and it's not a, as much of a settled matter as, as one might say. Right? So now we have three money measures. Consumer surplus, by far the most used measure. It's a triangle. You get it by finding total willingness to pay and subtracting out amount paid. By far the, the, the most uh, used of these measures. To get a firm theoretical basis for it, there are two exact measures, which you now know, compensating and equivalent variation. And you know for a good that's marketed, like electricity, all three are the same. So the measures that have good theoretical backing, CB and EB, give you the same as the thing that's easy to compute. If you're doing a market analysis, analysis of a market good, think not, just do consumer surplus. And then we said, all right, so that's not true for some types of goods. For some types of goods, CB, EB, and of course, consumer surplus could diverge widely. And then I created the example in which EB and CB are furthest apart, they're infinitely far apart. And consumer surplus lies somewhere in between. And that's unsatisfactory, but that is the way it is. So questions or are we done for a while? Then we are done, and I will see you on Tuesday.